We're live. Hey, look at that. We are indeed live, Courtney. Uh, wow. Well, hello, Courtney, since you and I Hi, are Joel. each other. What's up? <laughs> Good to see you. I'm excited for this. I haven't done a Google Hangout. If I have done one before, it's been a long time. I think maybe I've seen one, but I don't think I've actually been uh, on one like this. So I'm pretty excited. It's not something that most folks are familiar with. I think it's pretty nifty. I'm going to continue to use it as long as people take it as well. Well, we have a ton of folks who are joining us. Uh, I even, just a little while ago, I saw Emma Linda. She wrote on the G Plus event page that it's her birthday today. Happy she's birthday. She's the gift of participating in this webinar. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. If I could sing, I would actually sing for you, but I don't know if that would be a great gift. Should honestly. we save that for the end? <laughs> we'll save it for the end when the recording's off. How about that? <laughs> Well, Emelinda, it's kind of a gift to us that you're joining us, so thank you. And just looking at some of the other folks who are coming on through, I'm, I'm looking here, Jacqueline and DJ, welcome, Jesse, Susan, Allison, holy smokes, we're really grateful that so many of you are joining us. Hi, everyone, um, welcome. By the way, if you're watching through, there's a lot of ways to be watching this right now. You can stream it on YouTube, you can watch it through the G Plus event page. If you're watching through the Google Plus event page, uh, use the Q&A app at the bottom of the video window and just type in something like yes, if you can hear and see us just fine, just to make sure that Courtney and I don't have some giant blind spot, like you can't see us or you can't hear us. We wanna make sure that this is easy on everybody. Uh, well, first of all, for folks who don't know, my name is Joel Zaslavsky. Uh, I have my hands in a number of things these days. A value of simple is kind of my home on the internet. Uh, a lot of my time, most of my time actually right now, is with Simple Rev and trying to create a bigger crossroads between community and simplicity. My heart is deeply, deeply in both of those things. Uh, and as a representative of Simple Rev, I was thrilled to, since Courtney is so in alignment with everything that we're doing, uh, to have. You, Courtney, I won't say her, you're right in front of me. I don't need to speak in the second or third person. Uh, Courtney, for the folks who aren't familiar with you, I would mention the vast minority, but can you just introduce yourself a little bit too? Sure, hi guys. So my name is Courtney Carver, and you uh, might know me from my internet home, bemorewithless.com, uh, or maybe you don't know me and we're meeting for the first time, and if that's true, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, thanks, Joel, for, we were talking a little bit earlier, Joel has put this whole thing together and made it so easy for me. I am sometimes tech challenged and uh, there is a, I think, a misconception that I'm organized because I live simply, but in fact, I'm not very organized, which is why it's imperative that I live with less. So Joel has made this whole process so nice for me and uh, the, the entire webinar is really thanks to him and his amazing skills. So I'm excited to chat with all of you. And again, thanks, Joel. Jeez, am I, am I blushing here? I think my cheeks are starting <laughs> to glow. All right, so what, what are we doing here? Uh, this webinar that you and I agreed on, Goodbye Busy, Three Ways to Reconnect with What Matters Most. Uh, and it seemed entirely appropriate. I was thinking of this name and that name. And you uh, might bring up the busy boycott and other types of things. But really what a lot of people who are watching us, and me to some extent too, is we want to get rid of that, not just that feeling of busyness, uh, but the actual doing of busyness too and how it holds us back. So Courtney and I, we've communicated before this and uh, our goals for this webinar are pretty straightforward. So we want to help you stop feeling busy all the time. Uh, we're also very interested in changing the cultural narrative around this busyness thing, about it being a desirable thing, uh, and learning how to plug from your hardware so you can plug into what matters most. You get to find that, obviously, but we'll help you with the first piece. Um, relationships, health, work, everything else that surrounds us outside the world of going screens. Uh, and in this time that we're going to be spending together, we're going to explore uh, a number of things, plus the stuff that you throw at us, because we want to know what you want us to talk about and discuss. We have some things planned, but obviously we're highly interested in what you are thinking and doing as well. So we're going to talk about how feeling busy makes us act busy and the things that you can do instead. 
We're also going to be talking about breaking the link between time and money and how that helps you become a more composed, a uh, more liberated person. This one's from Courtney, how to end the endless game of catching up. Ooh, that's a good one. Email, social media, entertainment. Uh, and there are some folks, uh, myself included, Courtney, I know some of your backstory as well, uh, immersing yourself in some anxiety and perfectionism, maybe even sleep deprivation, uh, and how we can get out of that mindset of intentionally exposing ourselves to some of the things that make us busy. Uh, if you want some more extra space in your day, if you want the time and presence to underact to stressful situations, these are all the things that we're going to be covering here. Uh, and of course, we're going to be asking you questions along the way. We're going to give you plenty of opportunity to connect with your fellow webinar participants. That could be in the comments on the Plus event page. Please use that. You can send tweets to at simple underscore rev or use the hashtag simple rev. Uh, and as I said before, there's a Q&A feature that's built into Google Plus Hangouts that allows you to ask us questions that we can cover during our time together. So with that said, Courtney, anything I missed before you want to talk about something else? No, that's great. And yeah, send in your questions. We're happy to answer them uh, anytime. Right on. All right, well, number one, how feeling busy makes us act busy. Whew, this is a doozy, and I, I know we might have some trouble exploring this in a shorter period of time, but uh, one of the first things that I think about when I ponder how our emotions control our behavior, there's this fellow, his name's David Kane. He has this awesome blog called Raptitude, and he explains why most of our thinking is just simply unconscious reassociating. Uh, it just stresses us out, takes up our attention, and it's habitual busy work of the mind. Those are his words, not mine. I'm not clever enough to think of a good phrase like that. But Courtney, I want to hear from you first. This concept of feeling busy leading to actually being busy, how's that played out for you in your life? Yeah, well, I think a, a perfect example uh, that a lot of people can relate to, especially people that have a kind of a traditional Monday through Friday work week, is when you're enjoying your weekend and having a great time with your friends and family, and then on Sunday afternoon, you start to feel down and maybe even anxious about the week coming up because you start to think of all the things that you have to do in your work week plus your family life and how are you gonna cram it all in and Sunday at 2 p.m., you're already feeling that, that weight of the busyness that you have coming up even though it hasn't happened. And so not only do you compromise your free time um, and the attention that you might be giving to the people that you're spending time with, but you also kind of invite this busyness in before it's even started. And then by the time the work week does start, you're already like in this anxious, I'm so busy mode before your first um, obligation. And I think that thought process, you know, that's only one example. I think that can happen a lot. You know, you're laying in bed thinking about all the things you have to do tomorrow. And all of a sudden, the busyness that hasn't even happened is stealing your sleep. So finding a way to um, kind of break that mindset and paying attention to when you start to feel busy, I think is really imperative about breaking that mindset. So I'm just looking here, Nathan A on the Google Plus event page has already shared something. Hey, he's from Salt Lake City. Hey. I know, we just met. Nathan, hey, how are you? It's good to, that? glad you're here. Uh, so he says, uh, what to say instead of I'm busy, when you really are busy. Now sometimes we, that's an internal narrative. When we say I'm busy, we're telling ourselves, I'm busy, I gotta go. Oftentimes people ask us and we reply to that. So as far as how you start to shift that mindset, do you have something that's helped you make that shift or something that you recently experimented with that really helps? Yeah, the thing that has made the biggest difference for me is practicing meditation or having a mindfulness practice. So always in the morning and then often a couple of times during the day, I take anywhere from um, just a short five minutes up to a half hour to either sit quietly or listen to a guided mindfulness practice. And it makes me pay attention to how I'm feeling. So instead of just running on autopilot and letting my thoughts take over, when I start to feel that pressure 
or notice that I'm not paying attention, uh, I can kind of pull back and reassess and move forward differently. And it's taking that pause uh, to say, okay, wait a minute, is this reality? Is this what's really happening right now? Or am I making up something that's not happening, which is normally the case for me. Uh, and it, it didn't happen immediately. I mean, when I first started practicing that meditation, it wasn't an immediate, oh, wow, this it, you know helps enormously. <laughs> Just like anything, it took some time. But the more that I practice, the more in tune I am with uh, what's going on around me and inside me. Uh, so that has been the most helpful thing. I've had a similar experience. I've been meditating regularly for about a year now. Uh, not a ton, mostly just 10 minutes a day, although earlier this morning, I was doing a live guided meditation with our buddy, Christopher Carter. Uh, he has something called the pause, and I'll maybe refer to it later. Uh, awesome, just free guided meditations for 30 minutes. It helps tremendously, and mostly in ways that I don't know of. Uh, a lot of times it's when I'm feeling rushed, especially with my kids, and I just want to get them somewhere else to kind of leave me alone, having that sense that, hey, I can be patient right here, and I can be kind in that moment. And those two things, I've talked about this before, that link between kindness and patience. If you don't have the patience to deal with people respectfully and mindfully, then oftentimes you're not dealing with them in a very kind way. So that meditation portion has been huge for me as well. I'm kind of reflective on this stuff in terms of individually, but also culturally, how do we get to this point? in terms of our society, our culture, just having this focus, this emphasis on busy as a positive thing, and people telling themselves all the busy, uh, or themselves how they're busy all the time. And really, I don't read The Economist so much anymore, but I remember reading this great article a while back that was talking about uh, when the clock was first used to synchronize labor back in the 18th century, and how time has been understood in relation to money for the past approximately 200 years. And here's the issue is uh, when our, once our hours, once you're financially quantified, then people worry more about wasting them, about saving them, about using them profitably. And of course, with this constant push to grow our economy, the byproduct is that everyone's time becomes more valuable. And the more valuable that something becomes, the scarier it seems. Uh, do you have some kind of history lesson that you'd like to share for us too, Courtney, <laughs> or am I the only one who's just fascinated by how we got to this point? Oh, the, well, there's so many things I want to say to what you have just said. Uh, so I might bounce around a little bit here, but first about the time and money, there's a great book called uh, Your Money or Your Life. And it talks specifically about how we tie our time to money and how everything changes when um, you start valuing your time more than money. Uh, and when you really pay attention to, this is specifically, for instance, like how much you're working compared to how much you're earning. And I know we're talking about kind of breaking that tie, but when you really pay attention to that, you can, I think, even want to break that tie more because you see how ridiculous it is that, you're maybe passing up a great opportunity because you can put more time in at work. And I understand that we have to earn money to put food on the table, to pay our bills, to put our kids through college, whatever it is, you know, whatever financial obligations that you have. But I think we get caught up in that a little bit too much sometimes and really miss out because we're trying to get that extra hour in or that extra dollar in. So I, I don't know, <clears throat> I don't really know about the history of it, and I don't read The Economist, um, but I just think that it's, it's all tied to how busy we are as well. And well, when we look back, you know, we don't remember the number of hours or the number of dollars. We really remember those moments that we spend doing things that we enjoy with people we love. Absolutely. Well, let's turn it over to the folks who are with us right now and see what they think. So we've got a prompt for you. Uh, what's your perspective, this relationship between time and money that we're talking about? And is it a foundational piece of our cultural busyness? If you have something to say about that, we would love to see your comment on the Google Plus event page right now. Or you can send a tweet to um, You know, Whether or not you believe it, we just want your perspective on that relationship between time and money. 
So, okay, Corey. And so, I, let yeah. me just back up for one second. Yeah. So while people are, are giving us feedback on that, I just want to go back to the meditation conversation and um, say, first of all, that Christopher Carter, uh, Casey, is an awesome meditation teacher and really an example, such a great example of how meditation can change your life. And, and when you were talking about being patient with people, like your kids, for instance, that's a great mindfulness practice as well. Met, uh, patience, practicing patience, I think, is a great way to practice mindfulness. And uh, Rachel Macy Stafford, who writes uh, the blog Hands Free Mama, and also has, uh, I think she has, yeah, two books, Hands Free Mama, and now her new one coming out, Hands Free Life, is just another great demonstration of how patience brings mindfulness and, and joy to your life. So those are two resources I would highly recommend. Yeah, yeah, ditto. Ditto's not doing it justice, but definitely ditto on that. <laughs> well, let, let's, uh, so far, we've talked about some personal mindsets and cultural conditioning, maybe some uh, brief history lesson about how we got here. What I'd really like to know, you wrote this brilliant blog post, one of the ones that I send people to the most on Be One More Flex is uh, April 2014. It's called How to End the Endless Game Catching Up. And you cover sleep, entertainment, being present, the fear of missing out more in that post. Take us where you like for the next two, three minutes or so. But uh, as far as the how-to goes, maybe we'll start with email because that's something that everybody deals with day in and day out. How do I stop trying to constantly catch up with email? Sure. Well, just to back up for a second with catching up, I wrote that post because it was a problem for me. I always felt like I was running behind and then catching up. And so I would work longer hours so that I would be caught up on Monday morning. And then by Friday, I was totally behind again. And I finally just realized that if we stop catching up, nothing really changes, except that we can enjoy the process um, more than feeling anxious about falling behind. Um, so with email, I think obviously the more that you send, the more you receive, and it becomes this uh, vicious circle. And I've tried so many different ways to um, process my email, and I stopped. One of the things that's helped me is by not uh, dealing with email on my phone because I used to check it a lot, but I didn't often respond to it because I just don't enjoy typing on my phone. Uh, which I know a lot of people really use their phone solely for email, but I prefer to do it on my laptop. So instead of checking, 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 and doing nothing and just feeling behind all day long, I'll respond once or twice a day and sort of do what I like to call an email triage and figure out what needs immediate response, um, what I can uh, put in a batch folder to respond to, and just being really short and sweet in terms of response. You know, I try to be kind but brief, and uh, hopefully people don't misinterpret that uh, brevity for um, uh, coldness, I guess. You are, you're uh, quite good at it, too. I mean, you and I, we email so much for you. Yeah. And my emails are 12 sentences, maybe 15 <laughs> sentences, and you're like, okay, Joel, here's two sentences. I'm like, that's it. I got everything I needed, and I'm feeling good. I still have a smile on my face. Yeah, and I think the way we can avoid, because I know some people do get concerned with, you know, they want to be nice, and I want to be nice too, but the best way we can do that for each other is just start off by assuming that we mean well and want the best for each other, uh, and with that in mind, say, I value your time, so I'm going to keep this email short, uh, and it helps everyone. And oh, one thing that I've recently started doing with some of those longer or bigger answers that... I know it's going to take me a long time to write and organize my thoughts and edit. And so I just put it off for a week or more, which is terrible uh, because I don't want to or don't take the time to write back. I've lately been making audio recordings really, you know, short, but I can just kind of talk like this and not worry about where the comma goes. Uh, and, <laughs> and then people can hear, really hear, what I'm thinking instead of just reading it and assuming. Uh, so that's been very helpful. 
I do that too. I turn on my podcasting microphone because apparently I want to sound really good when I give people the internet <laughs> version of a voicemail <laughs> and I'll record audio messages. People love it. They absolutely love it because it's a novel way to do it. And it's so much more expressive, at least for me. I sure. don't like writing all that much and I try not to write all that much. So when I can be in a medium where I can use my full range of, of verbal communication, I just love it. One thing that you've also mentioned before is don't respond to anything that doesn't require a response. So if somebody hasn't explicitly asked you to respond to something, whether that's a text, whether that's an email, whether that's social media, maybe you don't have to respond to it at all and that can save you a lot of time. Uh, let's cover one more thing real quick. Uh, uh, post, sleep, entertainment, being present, the fear of missing out. Any of those you'd like to tackle before we talk about something else? Ooh, I think probably the most important one in terms of health and sanity is sleep. You know, we try to uh, cheat sleep to catch up, and it just never works because you work less effectively, uh, and catching up on sleep is sort of a, a myth. So if you only sleep five hours a week during the week and then you try to sleep in on the weekend, that really doesn't fuel your body or your brain. So I would say prioritize sleep. And if things have to be uh, left, left or let go of, so be it. As sleep is a priority. Yeah, it's kind of hard to function and do anything, whether you have nothing to do or whether you have everything to do if you're not sleeping properly. Here, here, yeah. Now. And we don't even know, I think. I mean, I remember operating on very little sleep and thinking that was normal. But once I, you know, kind of moved into sleeping seven or eight hours a night consistently and discovering all this new energy, I just thought, how, how did I even function? And I, there I thought I was giving my best when in reality I wasn't. Yeah. Well, let's leave people. We'll, we'll go to another thing. And there's some great comments. This is actually at the end of your blog post we were just talking about. If you don't have time to keep up, you definitely don't have time to catch up. And people can obviously read for themselves. I don't have to read for them. It's something not worth reflecting on, but acting upon. That This concept of letting go, starting fresh, and it's one that I absolutely love and that I do from time to time. Uh, and every time I do it, I'm just really grateful that I've done it. So let's move on to another thing is why we feel compelled to show how busy we are. It's a, it's, a, it's a cultural thing. I know when I've traveled to other places in the world, New Zealand, Japan, Spain, Israel, I don't get the same sense that I do, at least in North America, about this compulsion um, to feel busy and to be busy all the time. So uh, if you registered for this webinar via email, then we provided a short worksheet for you to use to get the most out of our time together. And one of the exercises that we asked in that worksheet was between when you signed up for it, whenever that was, and now, count how many times you send or read an email that contains something like, I know you're super busy right now, but, uh, or that you hear someone tell another person that they're, oh my gosh, so busy, so, so crazy busy. Um, if you have your number or you have something to say about this compulsion to keep assuming and telling each other we're all so dang busy all the time, leave a comment on our Google Plus Hangout event page or you can send a tweet to at simple underscore REB. Uh, Ashley, Courtney, before I turn it over to you, uh, in, in today's feedback, Amy asked, she left us a note before the webinar started uh, and she said how much she enjoyed the worksheet. And then she, she also noted how she emailed you recently and uh, assume that you were super busy, like far too busy to be dealing with an email from little old her. And she was shocked to see your reply that you weren't actually busy at all because you're highly successful in a lot of people's eyes and successful people are busy people, right? So how, do you know anyone else besides you and me who admit and are really proud that we're not in general busy? Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people. I'm not thinking of anybody right off the top of my head, although I know my um, very good friend, Tammy Strobel from RowdyKittens.com. She and I have weekly conversations, and I know, you know just from talking to her that it's really important for her to build in a great self-care practice into her day, which helps her not um, feel or act or be busy. Uh, and that's something that is important to me as well. And 
Yeah, that sometimes when people say in email to me, I know you're very busy, I understand they're uh, trying to be respectful of my time, which I really appreciate, but I like to let them know that I'm not that busy. And yes, I have busy days. Yes, I have, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of writing. I do a lot of different things for my business, but I, I organize it in such a way that my life comes first. And when I start to busy up my schedule in order to grow more quickly or, or do something bigger or better, I really remember why I left the corporate world and that was to create a business that supported my life and my relationships, not one that took it over. And so sometimes I have to remind myself and pull back. So yeah, I have busy days sometimes, but I don't have that general sense of busyness that I used to. And it's because I'm really intentional about it. And it just makes me smile a little bit when I get an email that says, I know you're so busy. And I think you and I were talking about it. My mom does it to me a lot. She'll say, I know you're really busy, yeah. but, and Your mom I, does it to yeah. you. you haven't trained her yet. To... And I, well, I say, I'm not that busy, you know, let's talk. Or she'll say, I didn't Skype you yesterday. Cause I know you're really busy. I'm like, no, call me. I'm not that busy. <laughs> um, but it's just about, for me, doing doing less and doing it really well. And yeah, that might take a lot of time, but I don't think that implies busyness. Yeah. Well, I'm, lo I'm looking here, Scott S. in our uh, G Plus event page. Uh, he says, 10 times this morning, he's heard people say something like, I know you are busy, but just already this morning. Wow. It's uh, just in one day. I, I, and again, I, I, this is maybe a compulsion that I have is how did we get here? Like what yeah. this for 99.999% of, of our existence as humans, we haven't felt this way. We haven't acted this way. So what changed to get us here? Uh, having leisure time, it was once a badge of honor. It was a sign of prosperity to just be able to chill out. And even as recently as a few decades ago, but a lot of people, the busyness seems to be our badge of honor. And yeah. it's, you just hear this, I'm super pressed for time, I'm busy all the time. And it's now we show our social status or how financially prosperous we are. Even, of course, our stress levels, and I'm speaking just generally here, or maybe I'm just speaking for myself. I know back in my financially prosperous times, my stress levels were sky high. My relationship quality was bottom of the barrel low. Uh, and it was just a, a, a really, really poor place to be. But just one thing I want to add, I'll turn it back over to you and the folks who are with us here. There's this fellow named Joe Todd. He wrote in a recent article for Salon, uh, and he put it so perfectly. He was talking about busyness it has a certain social cachet, which, of course, we chase it because it has social relevance. And when we look, try to, I'm reading here, when we try to look busy in front of the boss, but we're not just doing that anymore. We're trying to look busy in front of our friends and family, too. And sandwiching that 30 months, 30 minute lunch between a spin class and a shopping trip and yoga and meditation. And it's almost like each of these things becomes one more to do and it stresses us out as opposed to an opportunity to just slow down and just chill out. Uh, which kind of leads me into you wrote another blog post, Courtney, on Be More or Less. It's called Seven Invisible Benefits of Living Simply. And I think it's really important here. So instead of showing the world how busy we are, are there some alternative things that we could be communicating? Definitely. I want to say first, though, that you're right. We do try to look busy for other people. And I think that we do that to, uh, to prove our worth in the world. And I know that that was a big thing for me. You know, I would email, be emailing my boss or clients late at night that my boss would see. You know, you fill out these elaborate weekly reports to show how busy you are. And mm -hmm. I say, if that's, if that's your situation, it was definitely mine. And my bosses happen to really thrive on that. But I learned from that, that I always want to work with people who want my best and not my busiest, because it's just not a significant uh, measurement of, of how good your contribution is or your work is. And uh, I remember coming home from work and my husband would say, how's your day? And instead of telling him how I was or how my day was, I'd say, well, I did this and then I did this and then I did this as if 
you know, I'm just rattling off all the things that I accomplished, like telling him my to-do list, and that wasn't what he was asking. And so I was trying to prove to him and prove to myself and prove to the world that I had relevance and that I had something to give, but there are better ways to prove it. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to... Well, tell of, us one thing, if, if you don't mind, I found this fascinating. I think others will too. Yeah. The, one of the things that you mentioned is having the time and the presence of mind to underreact to situations. Yeah. I don't think anyone ever thinks of this term like, we're very familiar with what it looks like and feels like to overreact to something. But what does it mean to be able to underact when there's stress in your life or when yeah. it doesn't seem like you're swirling out of control to some extent? Well, when you're really busy and you're working in this sort of reactionary workflow or life flow, it's easy to overreact and to, uh, you know, say the first thing on your mind or put emotion into something where it doesn't really belong instead of really considering the facts we get really caught up in, I just got to respond to that or react to that. And so we say things we don't mean. Um, if we have time and we take time to reflect before responding, we can really answer from a thoughtful place instead of that fight or flight mentality. And I think that is a huge gift to the people that are coming to us with things that really just need a rational response or a caring response instead of a you know, hands up in the air, uh, crazy overreaction. Well, there's a lot more that we could talk about. Uh, Self-care and benevolence are things that you cover in that blog post as well. I all encourage people, if they haven't read it, to reread it or to read it a couple of times. Uh, but turning it back over to you folks who are with us, uh, we've got something that we would like to know. From your perspective, what's better than showing off how busy you are? And of course, we would love to know reason why you feel that way. Uh, Courtney, I think it would be kind of a good point. I'm seeing just tons of awesome comments. People are just engaging each other in super cool ways in the comments on the Google Plus event page right now. I want to acknowledge a lot of them, but oof, I don't even know which good comments to pick out. Let's, let's just talk about um, another big thing. So kind of transitioning into our third topic here that you and I thought about ahead of time and that people told us was important to them, why I'm plugging from our hardware is essential to tune into everything else. This is this is big. I mean, I'm just looking here. I'm staring at the blue screen. I have hardware in front of me. I have my smartphone next to me. Of course, it's an airplane mode because you and I, this is very important, and I don't care what's going on over there. But just being able to unplug from our hardware, our, our buddy Joshua Becker, I don't think he let me get away with uh, dropping some wisdom that he's provided. Uh, he talks about this, and, and I've reflected on this a, a number of times, is, and you've written about this too, is how we can never really realize how addicted or how strong the pull of our hardware, of our gadgets, of these glowing screens is until either somebody takes them away from us or until we intentionally push them away from us. Um, so do you have anything that you'd like to riff on when it comes to if you can't control it, how you can encourage other people to take some control and to help you help yourself, or internally you can develop that kind of motivation to really disconnect and have a sense of detachment from your gadgets. Yeah, well, I mean, I write about it and talk about it a lot because it's a problem for me. And I think it might come across as if it's not, but I mean, my whole career is based on being plugged in uh, but the quality of my work is based on being unplugged and also the quality of my relationships. And this is something I have to work on all the time. Uh, the other day, uh, Mark, my husband and I were out for dinner and I saw this couple sitting next to us and they were sitting at their table and they were both, you know, looking at their phones and having conversations that were completely separate from what was happening at the table. And it just, I don't know, it makes me sad because I think that we feel like we have this layer, new layer of connection, but we're doing it at the, at the risk of losing our, our greatest connections. And so it's really important. Mark and I both kind of remind each other that we have to unplug. I try to leave my phone at home sometimes when we go out or if I'm taking a walk. Uh, so that I, if I have that pull or that curiosity or that 
compulsion or whatever it is, that addiction, uh, it's not, it's just not in reach. Uh, I used to sleep with my phone by my bed and I'd wake up in the morning and the first thing I would do is look at the phone. And then all of a sudden, before I have a thought of my own for the day, I've got everyone else's thoughts in my brain. So having an hour a day or more to unplug, you know, making a cutoff at the end of the day, uh, having a full day a week, I think is amazing because just like any anything that we're addicted to, strong word, but true, whether it be coffee, sugar, phone, you know, we don't know the effect it has on our life until we're without it. So I highly recommend experiments in living without. Living, yeah, and you mentioned something there that I just want to make sure I emphasize is giving others permission, the way that you, I've heard you put it before, to invade your brain before you're ready. Is yeah. inviting the world through email, social media, uh, for, for me in a household, I have two young boys, and when they're awake, they're awake, and I want to deal with them. I love my family, uh, and they're a disruptive force, but a positive disruptive force. But sometimes I will intentionally seek out ways for people to set their agendas upon me and to have people invade my space, my brain, my mindset before I'm ready for them. Scott's actually, I'm looking at Google Plus again, he talks about having his phone with him all the time, and I know he's in IT. Um, Nathan is also, Nathan A, he's an IT too. Uh, Scott's talking about turning off all of his notifications and leaving it in do not disturb mode so that only his wife or father can get through. And it really makes his life easier and it also allows him to focus a lot more. I, actually, yeah. I think this, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say notifications are a big one. I don't have any notifications that happen on my phone or computer. Uh, and maybe that's why I didn't get notified about how to join the meeting. <laughs> today now that I think <laughs> about it but I don't miss them and I don't miss that like little ping 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 pulling me away from whatever I'm doing uh, our friend who we were talking about earlier KC Christopher Carter uh, we were having a conversation that always sticks with me and I really like I, I could have started crying when he was telling me this story but he said when he used to commute to work, he'd have this, you know, 60 to 90 minute drive to decompress until he got home. But now his office is in his house. And he says at the end of the day, this is how he disconnects. At the end of the day, I close my computer and that's like a sign for him that I'm closing down the day. And he said, and I walk I don't remember exactly how many steps, but I think he said it's like eight steps until he's downstairs and in his kitchen. And he takes each step mindfully thinking about this transition. And then when he gets into the kitchen, his little kids are there and he gets down on his knees so he can look them in the eye and be there. And that for me was just, I mean, kind of overwhelming because it's saying, you know, I can take my phone and my computer and my work, all of those things that are important, but realize what matters most, which are my kids. Wow. That doesn't surprise me knowing him as well. Uh, yeah. That he has that kind of ritual that he does between work mode and being hop mode. That's really cool. Well, I'd like to hear from, uh, from our fellow participants in this webinar uh, about glowing screens we've been talking about. Just a, a prompt you can share on Twitter, you can share on our G Plus event page right now, and of course, Keep responding to everybody here. I'm loving, loving the activity that we see. So if you had a magic wand, you just wave it all over the place and make everyone stop doing one thing with their glowing screens, what would be and why? We'd uh, love it if you share with us and if that generates any good questions. And in a little bit, we'll be covering some of the questions that have popped up that I know you're interested in having us answer. Can uh, I answer that question? Oh, please do. So I have like 10 things most immediately, but if I could only do one with my magic wand, it would be that people would stop using their devices in their cars. It's, it's a bad, like it's just terrible. And I can say this in an almost preachy kind of way because I was the worst offender. Uh, when I worked for my sales job, I mean, I would be on the phone, driving down the freeway, wishing that I could have my computer in the car so that I could respond to email. Like I wanted to do everything in my car. Uh, and now, and it's been many years that I swore off phones in the car. Um, but 
I look when I'm driving, which is pretty rare, but if I'm driving and I, I can't look to my right or left without seeing somebody on their phone, and I just think, you're risking my life here. They're risking mm. their life, they're risking my life, and there's nothing that important that you have to be on your phone while you're driving. So in the car, magic wand, phone's gone. That'd be my, my big wish. <laughs> Yeah, it's it kind of reminds me. So technology is no longer about if we can, but rather if we should. We have this limitless potential to be connected, to indulge at any point in time, uh, and oftentimes it's a it's a pretty good thing. It allows us to communicate sure. with people, to stay safe, um, to coordinate awesome meetups with folks when we're traveling. Uh, but that if we can, should we? That's a question that I I ask myself in my mind too. Uh, sometimes I, I break that too. I'm guilty like other people, not in the car. I mean, when my phone never comes out of my pocket when I'm in the car. Uh, but there are other times I, I've walked down the sidewalk and I've been texting with somebody and I think to myself, okay, you're one red light away from walking into traffic and not realizing it and getting hit by a car. I yeah. Mean, I can't walk and text at the same time. <laughs> like that's I, I that's not a should for me. I just can't. The same time. So why would I think I can walk and text at the yeah. same time? It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, if um, if you have anything more to say about that, by all means, Courtney, do. I'm looking. Uh, Emma Linda says if she could wave her wand, she would want people to put their phones away when I'm spending time with them. That's a big so one important. too. Having that having that phone on a table something that is physically like separating you from them, just keep it in your purse, in your pocket, somewhere else. Um, show that person that is with you that they are the absolute most important thing right now. And that's yeah. not the thing that could potentially be coming up. Well, it's a big message. It sends a big sign. Just like, like when I get on the, an airplane, the first thing I do, right or wrong, is pop in my earbuds, which is to say, don't talk to me. I'm on the plane. I'm going to be quiet. I like to fly that way, but when we're with people that we know and love and want to connect with and we put our phones on the table or we're looking at our phones, it's this physical sign, you know, that I'm not listening to you. I've got something else on my mind. I don't want to connect with you. And whether or not we know we're saying that, we are. So we have to, to like, just don't. Don't take the phone out. Have the conversation. And again, I have to remind myself of this all the time. Well, we have different personalities when it comes to that. The first thing that I'm looking for when I get on the plane, assuming I'm not traveling with my wife or kids, is for somebody to talk to. I almost want a shirt that says, hug me. I love hugging people. And talk to me. Oh, Seriously, what? it's totally cool. I, I, I want to talk to you. But I, I also realize that I'm in the minority here, and there are a lot of people don't get an opportunity for silence and an opportunity for quiet, an opportunity to slow down. So I constantly have to remind myself is there's things that you think are good that you want to engage in, but you need to let the rest of the world just chill out and relax and de-stress and not be so busy all the time too and not be constantly engaged. The conversation is highly engaging. At least I hope so when I'm involved. Sometimes it's not. Who knows? I'll let other people judge that one. Uh, I, and I, I just I put a lot of work into the ability to communicate with people in a meaningful and deep way. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's really difficult. I don't know if other people who are watching have that same issue too. I know I have my unique quirks, but I hope someone else is like, yeah, Joel, I, I kind of get what you're talking about. Well, just before we get into the q and I just want to transition real quick. You wrote a blog post last week on Be More With Less about how we can hang out together. This is one of those ways on this webinar. And again, for the folks who are watching live and anyone who's watching the replay, awesome. We're super happy that you joined us, that you're engaged with each other and with us. Uh, I've been putting a lot of extra work into, you know, after making dinner each night for my family and talking to them at the dinner table, you and I are going to be hanging out at uh, something called Simple Rev 2015, which is an event in Minneapolis, Minnesota on October 2nd and 3rd. Uh, and last year, it was when we did this for the first time, 55 people from across North America came for two days of intimate workshops and connection and just a whole bunch of tiny house enthusiasts and minimalists and permaculture geeks and all these cool people who just are all about uh, the world of simple living and also 
forming deeper connections within a community setting. In addition to you, Mark and Angel Chernoff and Farnoosh Brock, uh, some other Joshua Becker, uh, Liz Zurich Boudry, there's a lot of other folks who are going to be joining us. And Courtney, I just wanted to ask you for a second because I know this is important. You truly want to connect with people and hang on people. So for the folks who can or will make it to Minneapolis uh, in our Simple Rev 2015 event, is there anything um, that you're particularly excited about? You want to explain your role in this whole thing? Well, I am really excited, and I've talked about this before, but I am sort of an introvert. Um, probably, I have some, I'm not a shy introvert, but I do like time to myself and time for my family. So I haven't done a lot of um, big events. I've been to some conferences, uh, but I really enjoy the small events better where I can really get to know people and spend time and not feel like there are too many people to connect with. For me, that can get exhausting, but this I'm really excited for because not only do we have this shared interest, but all the people that I meet in this community, in this you know, sort of sphere of wanting to have more meaningful relationships, be healthier, live more intentionally, they're awesome people and they're just so kind hearted and just cool. And so I'm really excited to connect with my people um, at your event. <laughs> well, say the cool thing is it's not mine. I might be the primary organizer, I might be the guy to start this type of thing, but I love it. Each time somebody gets their fingerprints on it, uh, whether they help us with a little bit of graphic design work or whether they want to do something with our Simple Rev Local, these three reoccurring local gatherings that we're trying to foster around the world. It's just cool. Like, I don't want to ever be the, the, the forefront and the figurehead. I want people to step in and feel a sense of ownership. And it's cool just seeing how it expands. So just for folks who are interested, I mean, we're going to have the same kind of spirit and as we did in our event last year, it's going to be small. It's only 100 people or less. Uh, it's in Minneapolis. And if you can get there, great. If you can't, there's tons of other ways, whether it's with me individually, with Courtney, with Simple Rev. Honestly, I personally don't care. As long as people are simplifying and as long as they're engaging in community, I don't even care if they mention the word or the name Simple Rev ever again. I just want to see that happen. And I think we've got a pretty cool way to do that. Uh, what do you say, Courtney? Should we should we cover some questions that people Definitely. have thrown out there? I, I can't see the questions, so but I'm if you tell me what they are, if there are any for me, I'm happy to answer them. I think they're pretty much all for you. Uh, I, yes, and I will tell you the question. The first one is uh, from Ali Ona. She asked a question on our Google Plus event page, and I've I've heard a ton of variations about it. It's kind of a toughie. Maybe the softball for you. It's definitely a 95 mile an hour fastball for me. Bring it on. Uh, she, Bring it on, right. Uh, she says that she's in a relationship with a great man, uh, and unfortunately, he's addicted to a busy lifestyle. He's a multitasker. Every single slot, 15-minute, 30-minute slot on his schedule, he totally fills out, and he gets a lot of satisfaction from being constantly engaged in meetings, lectures, events, activities, all this stuff inside and outside the home, and really gets nervous. He starts to panic whenever he finds himself at home alone with free time on his hands. Uh, she'd like to help, but she's not sure how. What would you say to that? That That is a tough one. The first thing I think that is so important is that you really have to be an example of what it means to enjoy your free time or enjoy not being busy. It's very hard to convince others to do what you want them to do or what how you think they may be happier. Um, you first have to walk the walk. Uh, and the next thing is to really be thoughtful about why he is so caught up in that. And chances are, I mean, and people do thrive on different levels of busyness. Um, some really enjoy that external stimulation, I guess. But I think a lot of people, I would say most people, really define themselves by how much they get done, how busy they are. And so this really could be you know, something that fuels his confidence and his self-esteem, and that's why he's so attached to it. So I'd start by just you know, having thoughtful conversations about it, and not in a, you know, your way is bad and my way is good, but 
you know, where, where can we come together? How can we carve out some time just for us and put the rest on the side? And perhaps he can derive some joy from those moments that you create together, those quieter moments, those less busy moments, and, and really see what he might be missing. But yeah, wow. it's, it, it's a process. It's not going to be an overnight transformation. So if he's your guy, if he's awesome and you're in it for the long haul, then you're patient for the long haul and just, you know, again, kind of carving out moments for the two of you and really expressing how important it is to you more in, in how, how you're living it and demonstrating it versus, you know, bullet points and outlining it. It just doesn't often work. Mm. Well, I hope uh, Joseph T., who is responding to Aliona in the webinar page comments a little while ago, who said that he represents her other half, like her significant other, the guy who doesn't have time and always feels pressed and finds himself lost and panicked uh, when he does get some free time. Joseph, hopefully um, you're getting a little out of that as well. Uh, I got another one here for you, Courtney, which, and I'll, I'll field every some once in a while too, if it's kind of in my wheelhouse. Uh, one person she'd like to discuss how to make time to just be without feeling like a sloth or unproductive. Oh, so I say be a sloth and be unproductive <laughs> and really embrace that. There's actually this thing. So there's this book called, I think it's called Sabbath. And I'm not remembering the name of the author, but he writes about this thing called, uh, I think he calls it slotha yoga. And it's basically like laying around in bed, playing Scrabble, drinking champagne, like just making a little slothy time for yourself and embracing that. I don't think that that means you're lazy. I don't think it means you're unproductive. It means that you are indulging and it shouldn't even be an indulgence. Like we deserve that time to not that I drink champagne and play Scrabble in bed <laughs> often <sounds> but, funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like make it part of your ritual make that slothy time part of your ritual and don't feel like you need to explain it um, or justify it that would be my response to that and going back to that last question I would say also that my husband is kind of thrives on busyness way more than I do uh, but when we are on a hiking trail or we are out in nature, it's just shut off and he's so tuned in. So try a hike, get outside. I think that will help as well. Yeah. Being outside in nature has a way of focusing the mind, not on anything in particular, but, and there's something to it. I've read scientific literature about this. I've read tons of blog posts and podcasts about just simply being outside yeah and vitamin n people talk about vitamin n for nature like a lot of times we just do not get enough of that uh, and sometimes when you don't know what to do with yourself it's because you're inside and because you're feeling a sense of anxiety we as humans we're outdoor creatures we're almost wild animals at least as far as our brains are operating so spending some time outside whether i don't get to go on too many hikes because i live in the great plains and there aren't a lot of great hikes around here but being out with my dogs, I walk my two dogs for 45 minutes to an hour every day. And in addition to meditation, that's the cornerstone. That's the absolute pillar of my ability to um, get rid of that sense of busyness. It's just being out there, not looking at the clock or anything. And it just helps tremendously. Uh, all right. An another one here. And yes, folks, we are getting your answers in the Q&A. You've been using that uh, through the Google Hangouts app, the Q&A app. We've got a few that we're going to field there. This is, I don't know if this is a choice that people are prepared to make, Courtney. What's better? Uh, this comes from Melinda G. Really connecting with people in my life or the meaningful work that I have? Do you have to choose between Ooh. the people and the work that you do? I mean, honestly, if I had to choose, uh, of course, for me, it the people would come first. Uh, but I don't have to choose, and I don't think most people have to choose. Uh, and it's not for me about finding balance because I don't think that exists, you know, through my whole life, it's never existed. Uh, and there are times when work may take priority for a short period of time. But if you're putting the people first by letting them know, or even asking them for their support during that time, 
like, look, I'm, I'm working on this big project. So for the next month, I'm going to have to work on Saturdays or I'm not going to be available or I'm going to really need your help taking a look at this and letting me know, or I'll need your patience, you know, ask for what you need. I think that really helps remind the people in your life that even though you are focused on work for that period of time, that they come first and they really matter to you. Uh, but in the end, and you probably know this, if you've ever been working hard on something and a, one of your kids gets sick or a family member is in trouble, come on, we drop everything and we, and we help our family. That's what happens. And that's, it's in those moments that we say, this is what's most important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yes all of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as, as somebody who's a incredibly social animal, for me, it's always my relationships. And a lot of times it's how do I incorporate my relationships into my work? Now, it's become a lot easier as an entrepreneur because I get to choose the people that I work with, that I do business with, uh, people who I get to engage with. And that's not something that I take for granted. Uh, I didn't get to do that for over a decade. And, and so sometimes it's the kind of work that you do or the kinds of people who are involved. Can you bring in your friends? Can you bring in your family into editing your blog posts or helping you produce a podcast or with your artistic endeavor? How can you make it a family affair as opposed to a solo act? Uh, sometimes your work and your friends and your family can become one and unified in some pretty nifty ways. According to this one, is from Mark and Laura Tong. Hey, Mark and Laura, glad you're here. They're over in the UK, good folks. Uh, they say, have you thought of ditching email altogether like Leo Babauta of Zen Habits has? Uh, I don't think Leo Babauta has ditched email, actually. I think he might have experimented with that, but uh, as far as I know, he, he emails, he has email. Uh, I think he's probably way more selective because he probably just gets mountains of it. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I've never considered not having email. Uh, it's really a big part of how I communicate. Uh, I walk away from it. Uh, I go into email denial occasionally and just ignore it. But <laughs> mostly it's, it's just a great way to communicate. And so while I try to... Uh, have parameters around it and make it a very uh, useful tool. It's probably something that is going to be around for me uh, for a long time <laughs> until something mm -hmm. else comes along, I guess. Yeah, there's some things that I've started using with other people, at least from a work perspective. There's something called Slack. And the whole premise of Slack, you can go to slack.com and check it out just to get you out of your email box. It has chat features, it integrates with Dropbox and a whole bunch of other things. It's really nifty. And yes, you can use Slack to generate emails and you can still do things there, but from a collaborative perspective, if you're doing a work in a team of two or more people, I think that Slack is wonderful and has helped me spend less time in my email box. I don't think I would want to ever give up email completely, but I certainly want to spend less time in my inbox like most people. Uh, Jacqueline over Jacqueline S over here on the Google Plus event page comments, and she talks about uh, disruptions, especially email. At least for me, there's no bigger disruption than email, and how there's scientific research that each time you switch tasks or you switch your focus, it takes you upwards of 20 minutes yeah. to get back into that focus or to fully re-engage, whether it's with a person or whether it's a project. The cost of switching, of being distracted, and having that sense of busyness and flip-flopping is huge. And that's just something that we can't do anything about. We can't train ourselves not to re-engage faster as far as I know. So yeah, that's and I, it, that's such a great point. And we've all done it where we you know, click on a Twitter link or something else and while we were doing something else. And then all of a sudden we're on a hot sauce recipe and then we're wondering where hot sauce came from. and by an hour's gone by and we don't even care about hot sauce. Whatever it is, like these things happen. And so scheduling distractions, you know, okay, for 20 minutes, I'm going to, like going back to the slothy thing, I'm going to uh, mindlessly surf the web, you know, do it. I think that eliminates the, you know, our, our, need to check out or numb out or whatever it is that we feel compelled to do when we do those things. Mm -hmm. 
Well, there's wow, um, there's some other pretty good questions here. I actually want to tackle one too. Okay, this okay, is the yeah. podcasting nerd in me. Uh, there, Melinda asks, "How do you record an audio in depth?" I'm going to show people how I do it. Okay, I'm, I'm bringing this into the picture right here. So here's my podcasting microphone. I know it's like, whoa, this dude's got a podcasting microphone in front of his face. Just showing you. So I'll turn this on. There's a lot of different software. Uh, Audacity is something that's free that it works for Windows. It works for um, iOS. It works for Mac. I mean, it works for everything. GarageBand, whatever. There's a lot of things that come pre-installed on your computer or hardware, whether it's a smartphone, a tablet, or a laptop. Um, so as long as you have a microphone, it doesn't need to be fancy like this. I just, I'm talking to my webcam right now, and I'm thinking, Joel, you don't sound as good as you normally do because you're not using the podcasting microphone. So I'll turn that baby on. Uh, I'll open up my software, and I'll hit the record button. Now, uh, once it's done, I will then save that file. There, and again, this is a little bit technical, but save it as an MP3, a format that everybody is familiar with. It's also a very small file that you can either upload to Dropbox and share a link to, or you can just email it as an attachment. And that's really it. Three steps. Have a microphone, have some software that allows you to record something, and then compress that audio file into an MP3 format that people can play and are accustomed to, and send it to them. Hopefully that helps. Helps me. <laughs> I'm going to change the way I've been doing it. <laughs> how, how do you do it? <laughs> All I do is open uh, QuickTime and talk and then email it. So maybe I need to compress the file and uh, I don't know. I probably won't get a microphone but or well, other software. I might not change that much actually, but I will compress the file. I never thought of that. I like your workflow better. It is certainly simpler. <laughs> Uh, I have been accused of doing comprehensive simplicity, so still simple, but a little bit more comprehensive than most people are accustomed to. And I, I think it's just the audio realm that I interact with. And, and I have to admit, I still have some perfectionist tendencies that I'm trying to resolve. This might be one of them, as opposed to do people really care what my audio quality is when I send them an uh, MP3 message? Probably not. As long as it makes them smile and they can understand it, that's probably good enough for them. So I actually like your method better, Courtney. <laughs> and I, I would recommend that people do your method more than mine. Uh, well, I think you know this seems like this seems like a great place. We promised people that we were going to be respectful of their time and that we were going to take sixty minutes. We're at that sixty minute mark right now. Uh, for everyone who has engaged each other sent us tweets, uh, posted comments, used the Q&A feature. We're, we're super happy, beyond happy and grateful that you've joined us for this. And uh, just to recap, hopefully you know, by having this conversation, you and I, Courtney, and everyone else has been involved, so people will at least feel less busy, and then maybe it will get them into acting less busy. Uh, you talking about the endless game of catching up, email, and just a number of other things. I can share, and I'm happy you, you can do it as well. The two blog posts that we focused on of yours uh, are wonderful uh, and have really, I, I hope, have helped some people. Our, our goals, we just want you to have a new perspective and a few new tools to stop being so busy and to change this historical uh, shift. Hopefully, this is a point where we can start slowing down as a society as opposed to continuing to try to speed up, changing this cultural narrative around being busy, having it being a desirable thing, and then unplugging from our hardware. Just a little housekeeping. So for those of you who are watching live or you got you tuned in late and you want to catch the start of it, I'm going to be emailing the link to the replay on YouTube in the next 24 hours to people who signed up for the webinar through email. Look for that soon. Uh, you can also watch the webinar replay on simplerev.com. We've got that webinar registration page at simplerev.com slash CC webinar. It'll be available there in 24 hours. Really, I hope it's not the end of our conversation. Courtney, I know it won't be the end of our conversation, you and me. Definitely but for not. Else. Uh, keep the chatter going with folks who you you made you smile or that you connected with uh, over social media or keep the conversation going with me and Courtney. We love, absolutely love hearing, engaging, connecting and hanging out with you folks, uh, whether it's in person or whether it's on social media or wherever else that you'd, you'd like to be. 
Courtney? Can I throw wow. a challenge out there? Oh, please, yeah. Yeah, I just want to say that because tackling busyness is a huge deal. I mean, it's sort of like decluttering in this really massive way. It doesn't happen overnight. So if you can't feel busy, uh, feel less busy or be less busy right away, I'd like to challenge you to, uh, for the next 10 days, to let's just stop talking about how busy we are. So ban the word busy from your vocabulary for 10 days and see how that feels. And so don't tell people how busy they are. Don't talk about your busyness. Uh, and you'll catch yourself now that you're thinking about it, but measure it after 10 days. See if it feels any different where you haven't used that word busy uh, for 10 days. That sounds like an awesome challenge. What? Where are we going to get people's results. What are they going to do? Are they going to use a hashtag or how are we going to help compile this? Or it's just, it's a personal experiment. They'll know how they've done. Yeah, I think so. Or, you know, feel free to, to, to chat about it. I don't know how we'll talk about it without using the word busy, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out. Oh, goodness gracious. Well, hey, Courtney, thank you for having this conversation, for carving out time for me, for carving out time for everybody else. It's been a real treat. Uh, to host you on this webinar. For the folks who aren't familiar though, Courtney, where would you like folks to connect with you? Oh, oh my gosh, anywhere that's good for you. I'm on, I'm on Twitter at Be More With Less uh, and Instagram the same. Uh, you're welcome to email me, although expect a, probably a short response. Uh, and yeah, hopefully I'll see you in October in Minneapolis for my first time visiting there. Oh, it's lovely. In I can't October, wait. Except for last year when it snowed on October 2nd and it was about 35 degrees. Total fluke. It's going to be 70 and sunny this year. I know it. Uh, I like snow. Uh, that's true. You do like snow. I do. Too. I'm in the right place for yeah. that. Well, for everybody uh, who's watching, whether it's the replay or live, thank you again. Uh, all your tweets, all your comments. It was wonderful to host you for this chat. And we're really excited to uh, keep engaging you in a lot of really nifty ways.